So, hi everybody, I'm Steve Hinchman. I am uh, Chief Counsel and Director of Development for Revision Energy, which is the state's largest uh, solar uh, installation company. Also do electric vehicles, uh, LED lighting, and um, helping people convert uh, space and water heating from oil to renewable, renewables through use of heat pumps, so air source heat pumps and water heat pumps. So I moonlight as also as a, one of the partners in Grid Solar. Um, and I'm, I'm really speaking to you about the Grid Solar project, but my, my background is in, in, in trying to find ways to overcome barriers to deployment of solar LEDs and heat pumps and electric vehicles in New England wide uh, in, our, in our market. Um, and <clears throat> actually we have a couple of revision um, cohorts here, Jen and, and Jill from the Portland office. Uh, Revision um, is often engaged in a lot of these kinds of activities in our communities. <clears throat> um, before I start, I just want to um, mention to everybody that this morning the Public Utilities Commission in deliberations once again changed the rules for net metering for solar, um, which were supposed to go into effect May 1st. They've now accelerated it to March 1st, or to March 16th. So, um, at, starting on March 16th, the new rules with, regarding gross net metering will come into effect, meaning that any customer that expected to have their project installed between March 16th and May 1st now suddenly has rules changed on them. Um, this sort of whiplash. Uh, as an economic regulator, you're supposed to uh, deliver economic um, stability and certainty and fairness um, and and to have this sort of aggressive, unprecedented attack on renewables, this, it's impossible to run a business when your customers um, have the rules changed out from underneath them. They've already put their deposits down. Their projects are in the queue. We've filed applications to build their projects. And suddenly the rules are changed on them that change the, their returns. It, it's just, it's an unconscionable um, and, and bad faith um, regulatory move by uh, an executive branch that um, we're seeing aggressively go after renewables. Uh, and take, just take the wind example that it was in the papers this morning. Uh, it's a lawsuit where the several wind companies and, and a trade group are suing because um, the, the administration has um, arbitrarily put a moratorium on processing of permits and until they run it through a secret stakeholder process group that's closed to the public you can't even know when they meet who's on it and what they say and they're going to rewrite the rules this is not that's that's how banana republics work that is not democracy it is not uh, constitutional it's not legal you can't block people from getting their permits reviewed under existing rules arbitrarily just because you want to. You can't change the rules on solar customers midstream on projects that are already in process just because you want to. We are in a political administration that is attacking relentlessly renewables. Remember the attacks on the efficiency main budget? Anything that would reduce your consumption of fossil fuels is being shut down by this administration in a thorough and programmatic way. They're going after everything we're doing trying to reverse our economy's addiction to fossil fuels. At a time when climate science says to us that, that in order to avoid the worst effects of climate change, we have to completely disconnect our economy from uh, carbon. You go to a zero carbon economy uh, essentially within 10 to 20 years, <clears throat> by 2050 at the latest, in order to avoid the worst effects of climate change. And in fact, we may also have to couple that with decarbonization where we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere in order to um, slow down the effects of climate change. And uh, you know, I don't want to talk about the science of climate change or whether it's accepted or not other than to make the point that the task before us is immense 
um, and that the consequences of not acting we're seeing in the form of the kinds of, of weather events that are getting to be much more commonplace uh, and the departures from the range of normal with regard to weather events um, that we set new records every year and these events have significant cost effects um, whether it's it's storms like we've seen in Texas and in Maya and Florida and the Caribbean whether it's fires like we're seeing in California whether it's certain droughts whether it's uh, the disruption of the winter um, snow-based economy in New England and how that affects snowmobiling and skiing and, and other aspects of our economy, um, food production, it goes on and on and on and on. Um, so it's extremely expensive for us as, as a society to not address climate change. Um, if you put those two things together, there's an urgency to act and the level that we have to go to, to to transform our economies um, that have been built on fossil fuels. That task is, is, is massive and we have, you know, the darkest hour before the dawn, we have um, both in the state and the federal level administrations that are um, sort of bald-faced uh, efforts to block anything that would reduce your use of fossil fuels. The EPA climate plan um, rejection by the current EPA administrator where he says we're going to get rid of the clean power plan and instead we're going to, re they asked for a subsidy for coal and nukes uh, on, the, on the theory of grid reliability. And um, so we're going to reverse the Obama era clean power plan and actually accelerate our use of, of coal and, and, and nukes and gas. Um, you know, that's the direction our current political leaders are sort of taking us. Um, so that's to the context for um, those of us that are committed to sort of making this, turning the cruise ship, and don't want to stay away from military metaphors, um, turning this massive ship around, you know, that's the context of, of how difficult the fight's going to be and, uh, and how much change we have to make and how urgent it is. <clears throat> and so we have uh, communities, uh, colleges and universities, mayors, uh, for example, that are making climate pledges uh, to meet climate reduction goals within a, a set time frame. Both the cities of Portland and South Portland have done that, and they're very aggressive climate goals. Um, and um, you know, you see a lot of uh, cities um, uh, committed to meeting the climate, the Paris Climate Accord uh, goals, for example, is another one. Well, how do we actually do that, and what does it mean, um, and where do we do it? What parts of the economy? Where do we get the biggest bang for the buck? Um, and what is, what is it going to, how do we deploy capital to make that happen? <clears throat> and what are the programs that we put in place? And, and so when you, when you start asking yourself that question, so you, now let's ignore the political maelstrom that we're in and the dire predictions and everything. And let's just talk about mechanically, how do we set about the task of meeting our climate goals and making the changes that we're talking about? Well, um, the first, and let's, let's just look at the cities of Portland and South Portland um, because that's what our project, first project involves. Um, the first task is um, to know what our current benchmark is. And we don't know that. So how much energy do the cities of Portland and South Portland use citywide, not just the municipal load, but everybody in the whole city. We don't actually know that. And if you don't know what you use, where you use it, how you use it, when you use it, and why you use it, you can't possibly implement um, programs designed to cost effectively and aggressively reduce that energy use and switch carbon intensive energy uses over to carbon free energy uses. So the, the um, 
Grid Solar um, has proposed, together with the Sierra Club of Maine, uh, a pilot project where um, we would map energy use in the, in the two cities on a fine grain level. So parcel, tax map parcel level mapping of energy use. So this building is, is, is a single tax parcel on the city tax maps. Um, you go out into a neighborhood, every house on the block is, is probably a different parcel. Um, you, if, you, if we knew sort of what office, every office building, and, and, and so every parcel has a characteristic, it, it, residential use, retail, office, parking garages, hospitals, uh, public facilities, libraries, town halls, things like that. So, you know, we, we can, if we're able to map parcel by parcel and you can assign parcels to their, their sort of category, um, then you can start looking at programs that go uh, incentivize residential improvements or that um, look at retail space or look at public facilities, churches. Um, you know, you can really start to analyze um, by sector and activity potential solutions. Likewise, we can look at the differences between electric, electric use, which we know is around 16% of our total energy use, um, compared to uh, transportation, which we know is around 50% of our total energy use, and then in between is space and water heating. Um, and so we can, if we were to, able to develop parcel by parcel level data, uh, we, would, we would be able to identify uh, things like how much of our energy use actually matches those numbers that we think are true but we don't know are true. Um, and within any category, let's say space heating, why is this building not, what is it outside today? 45 degrees? 50? Yeah. yeah, so why isn't this ambient air temperature? It's because it's heated. What's it heated with? I don't know. Do you? Anybody know what this building's heated with? Gas, oil? Gas. Hot water, gas. Gas, hot water? Yeah, do we know how much this building uses? No? Yeah, so could we, could we identify um, a space heating solution writ large for all of downtown without knowing sort of where are the prime opportunities based on con consumption per square footage, for example? You know, does that mean we want to go into modernizing furnaces? Do we want to change out windows? Do we want to change out insulation? Do we want to you know, what, what sort of strategies would actually work and be cost effective? We don't know that because we really don't know and we have no good way of comparing uh, energy use. So, so the, you can see how if we had partial level granular detail, we could programmatically go about the business of identifying the most cost effective ways to decarbonize our economy. Question on, on the context, are you talking about the data that you're trying to build? Is this cumulative use or is this instantaneous load for, for <coughs> usage? I mean, for heat, uh, load's going to be hard to get for oil, for instance, because I've got a big, you know, I'm going to have a big tank out back, and when it turns on, it turns on, but it's hard for you to track that as, a, as an observer, right? Yeah. I'm wondering. What kind of data you're trying to collect? Is it yeah? Uh, uh, that's, know, is it instantaneous or is it like across a year? This building is so intensive with with respect to gas, <coughs> electric. Hey, dot. Uh, I see. Other energy. Come, grab a chair. Um, that's a great question. Let's talk about the quality of the data that we can get, because um, I think the answer to that is the practical reality is going to drive drive the answer. So, um, <coughs> we can get parcel level detail by meter for electricity from the utilities. Um, so that we know we can get, and we can get it in a format that can go into a database. Um, we can get, um, if we're able to work with the oil and gas providers, we can get parcel level detail on deliveries. Um, 
we can get partial level data on square footage of buildings. Um, we think we can. We don't know how good it is. Um, we can get partial level data on um, building type and use. Um, and we can, um, we can get specific information um, from certain parcels based through intensive audits that we can then use to extrapolate in general for uh, parcels that match the same characteristics. So we would ground truth as much of it as we could to verify the data that we could, as we could. In transportation, how in the world are we going to identify what transportation energy um, applies uh, citywide, parcel by parcel? We can collect um, information, say, the number of vehicles, number of miles driven. Um, can we get an MPG figure to apply to that um, for the, the vehicles? Probably not. Um, we can use some averages. Um, we can get the city um, mass transit. We can get public sector um, transit numbers, possibly from some of the uh, um, taxi and other companies. Um, but you can see right away that even as good a data as we can get, it's going to have huge gaps in places. Um, and for instance, um, let's say we, we had all of the oil and, and gas deliveries for um, buildings served by oil and gas for space heat um, for the year 2015. Uh, we could take uh, heating degree days and get a BTU figure per square foot. Um, that would then be a metric that we could apply across future years in an in a apples to apples sort of way. Um, but we, you know, we are trying to, what we want to get is the best level detail that we can, um, multiple years if we can, parcel by parcel if we can ground truth where we can, um, and possibly taking some neighborhoods um, that might volunteer to actually have super intensively granular data that we can use as representative to um, corroborate the rest of the results we're getting and calibrate the results we're getting so that we can have higher quality level detail on um, the results that are coming in by importing information on a broad level. Just think, you know, I'm trying to, because I'm familiar with what you're doing. I'm thinking all along about how we measure transportation. And it's not, except for parking lots, it's not really parcel by parcel, but corridors and destinations. You know, the, the issue with transportation consumption of energy is congestion. So it's the corridor to more than the parcels. That, that's a really good point. And let me, let me say that the idea behind this is to, through learning through experience, to try to figure out how to do this cost effectively and accurately because there are dozens and dozens and dozens of cities that have made the climate pledge that actually want granular detail on their energy use that they can then use to develop policy. So what I've described is the first part, which is the baseline data on energy use. The, the second um, thing that we're trying to do is to um, also map the energy delivery systems. <clears throat> and in particular, the electric grid. And um, the reason why is, is because um, the best and fastest way to decarbonize our economy is through beneficial electrification. And what I mean by that is um, if you switch out a, a oil furnace for an air source heat pump and the air source heat pump powered by electricity is connected to uh, say PV solar or PV solar with batteries or tidal or wind power or some other renewable source of energy, you're effectively decarbonizing the space heating uh, to the, based on whatever your, your marginal carbon 
level is per kilowatt hour of electricity. Because obviously it's going to be a blend, it's not all going to be renewable. Um, so beneficial electrification represents taking somebody off a of liquid fossil fuel, and putting, putting them onto electricity that's increasingly renewably sourced. Uh, and we know that we can decarbonize transportation through electric vehicles charged by renewables. We know that we can decarbonize space heating and water heating through uh, air source heat pumps or geothermal heat pumps um, powered by renewables, combined with insulation and, and you know, uh, weatherization and, and those other things. Um, so we know that the electric grid is going to be the primary delivery mechanism of, of a decarbonization strategy for electricity itself, but also for transportation and, and space heating. Um, and think about that for a second. Right now, if, if electricity uses only 16% of our total electric use, and we want to go 100% decarbonized, that means we basically have to um, increase our delivery of electricity sixfold. Do we have a strong enough grid to do that? Dot. I struggled, one, getting the data, and two, wrapping my mind around what really makes more sense with the number of uh, utilities like to talk about BTUs from their plug but obviously they had to make the electricity and they had to transport the electricity to the plug and do you have a data figure that you feel comfortable with with what is the efficiency of getting that electricity to the plug you mean in terms of line losses? Line and losses in manufacture. I've heard it's, you know, 50%, 43% actually. And I think that sometimes that's lost in the translation. And actually utilities don't like to talk about what that number is. Sure. Okay. So that, that's, a, that's a fair point that the, um, the electric grid is, is, in terms of efficiency of delivering energy, uh, has... A lot of problems and um, some of that can be represented just in line losses and some of it's represented by the fact that you always have to have load and generation and balance and to do and you never you can't identify exactly what loads going to be so you actually have to have way more generation so that you can instantly match load and then generation that's not needed is terminated and lost um, one of the ways you would uh, can account for that is just in time just in place delivery of electricity, which is a distributed grid, not a central grid, um, where you have rooftop power on the roof delivering to the building. Uh, I do you, ha you have storage. That if you admit to all those losses, all of a sudden some of the distributed grid seems to make a lot more sense. Yeah, right. So there are solutions that you need to make the grid efficient. And in order to make the grid efficient, you actually have to know uh, um, what the grid's capacities are, and if you're going to increase load by sixfold in in a decade or two in order to achieve all these other benefits, um, you're also going to have to beef up the grid, and you want to do it in the most cost-effective way. Um, so um, if that will result in higher capacity factor in the grid and, and address the problem you have. You're talking about you're talking about a, a different issue than I'm talking about, though in that um, what we're talking about is how do you decarbonize the economy and within a very short time frame, you know, a, a generation, um, using the tools that we have. So we may have an electric grid that's 60% efficient, and we may improve that to 70 or 80% efficiency, but we're not going to completely solve that problem. Um, but we don't have a way to decarbonize transportation other than electricity. And, and maybe um, uh, hydrogen fuel cell technologies, but those are also very electric based, um, although the distribution part of it's not so much. Um, and maybe that'll evolve and be a, a tool we can use. But for right now, um, if, if everybody started driving electric vehicles and what Volvo says in what, two, three years, that's all they're gonna sell, um, 
what's the, our grid in order to, to supply that electricity? When are people charging those vehicles? Where are they charging those vehicles? And what's the distribution to those points look like? And um, what we learned through the Booth-based smart, smart Grid Pilot Project is the utilities currently um, monitor the existing electric grid essentially from the top down. So the, the grid is, is comprised of um, remote generation stations primarily that are connected to high voltage power lines. Um, and, and you know, you guys see those driving around the state. And then those high voltage power lines are the interstate corridors, if you will, the interstate highways um, uh, of the electric grid. So they're connected, all the, the centralized power plants are connect, connected directly to those, hydro, et cetera. And then those go to substations where it's broken down to lower level um, power lines, the, the wooden ones that are smaller, not the big metal ones that are way in the, in the but the smaller wooden ones. And those go to nodes where there's substations that then serve the distribution grid that goes down the street. So, you know, the power feeding this building, for example, is, is probably a much higher level um, power than, than a residential neighborhood. On a residential neighborhood, that's 1245 KV lines going down the street. Um, the utilities monitoring stops at the substation. So they, they're looking from the top down, they're look at, and at the substation, they just know what's leaving the substation. They don't know what's out at the end of the line. And in the Booth Bay Smart Grid Pilot Project, what we were doing is um, building a model that looked at the grid from the bottom up, from every uh, single electric use up. Uh, and you can do it by appliance by appliance, but really um, most of the modeling work that's being developed, and this is almost all coming out of California, is looking meter by meter up. Um, where, where they're deploying smart houses with smart appliances, they're actually looking from appliance levels up. And when you, when you do that, you're looking, um, imagine a circuit, let's just take uh, the Booth Bay Peninsula, which is a, um, a, a lot of grids are designed to be all looped together. But in Maine, we have a, a lot of our grid is, is just a radial line out that terminates because it's a literal peninsula. And so the, the utility knows what's happening here. They don't know what's happening all the way down here. <clears throat> But at the very end of the line, that house has to get electricity uh, within 5% plus or minus tolerance of the standard. But every time power is used going down, the voltage drops. So to get power down here to the level that you need, you've got to increase it up here. And this is why Dot's point about efficiency, this is where it happens on the distribution grid, is, is they're wasting a lot of power to get to the power quality standard you have to have at the end. Well, in a, in a distributed grid, you would have along this line, you'd have inverter-based solar systems or battery systems that are monitoring that grid all the way down, and you can adapt immediately in real time and change voltage levels so that you're, it's called conservation voltage, where you're not wasting electricity as, to, to keep the guy on the end at his, his required standard. And you've got a device maybe just up the street that can move it up and down, improve power quality that supports the grid here, and here, and here, and here, instead of all the support coming from here, if that makes sense. I'm wondering if you have any connection right now with the Island Institute and Brooks Winter and some people who are kind of housekeeping islands because I moved from an island to where we live now in Midcoast, Maine. And now that we're with Amera, we're 35 persons on this <coughs> island. We're not exactly a priority. So it seems like what you're talking about would be dramatically um, illustrated by you know going to the far reaches of a place like that. Sure. Um, yes, I am talking to Island Institute, and yes, these things would apply. Yeah. The utilities need to know this to, to have a smart grid. Um, they, they put in smart meters that we all paid for that were programmed to not collect this information. 
Yeah. It's essential main power. They, it, if you changed out the chip and you changed out the programming, you, it could. It would be expensive, but you could do it. Right now, the utilities aren't doing it. I think that was a conscious choice. Um, but in Booth Bay, we happened to have a, a circuit where we had, in the industrial park, we had a backup electric generator, we had a battery storage, uh, and just across the street, we had a PV system. So we have these, these, these radio lines where we could, we were actually measuring voltage in real time, and we could see what happens when, a, when the sun comes out, when the sun goes down, when motors turn on and off and it changes voltage. And so uh, you have all these distributed resources on that line that you can now then use to su support and strengthen that line, meaning that um, a solar power with a smart inverter can push reactive power as well as real power out onto the grid. Reactive power will stabilize voltage. Um, so rather than pushing more power from up here down on a bigger and bigger conduit with bigger and bigger poles and higher off the ground with bigger insulators, you know, now you can have a grid reacting in real time, two-way between customers and the utility, self-supporting and, and able to um, use renewable resources to provide grid stability and reliability and at the same time enhance capacity. Um, and so the, the guys that have built this model are out in California. It's called New Power Technologies. And um, they're as interested as we are in finding a way to, remember the goal here is to deliver to the cities of Portland, South of Portland, a menu of cost-effective solutions to meet their carbon re reduction goals. We know they're going to need the grid to effectively do that. So we want, to, we want to build out that grid in the most cost-effective way uh, and in the way that will support the in most um, renewable and sort of efficient solution. So to, so to use the electric grid as the primary vehicle to deliver carbon benefits, it's got to be, we know it's going to have to, the capacity is going to have to be increased, like we said, sixfold. So capacity is a huge issue, but also the efficiency of it and the um, effectiveness of it at the least cost. So we really are going to need a model of the grid that looks from the bottom up that's designed to say, put solar here and the whole rest of that system is strengthened. Um, and if you put solar here, you actually cause additional problems until X, Y, and Z are done. So now we have a work order for X, Y, and Z that's built into the, the build-out schedule, if you will, for that part of the grid. Go ahead. It sounds like what you're describing is, is that the, the current system is, is built under the assumption that every node is a consumer, right? Every node is a, is a, is a net is a net uh, load on the system, right? With the exception of those giant plants that, that put, the, put the electrons in, into motion, right? Um, and so what we're trying to move to is a, is a, is a thing where, where your node could be a net producer, right? So Net producer of not just energy, but voltage support, frequency regulation, all kinds of things that stabilize the grid. Right now, right now, the, the system itself isn't built to accommodate that kind of a we regulative have, instance. We have a one-way grid. Right. What you're describing is a two-way grid. So, so uh, you know what? You know, next step would be, and this just sounds like where you're where you're going is that that the, you know, the, the the utilities themselves have knowledge about you know which which line segments are over are, are over capacity or nearing over subscription and and so there's immense value to them to have to have help on those on those on those points of the star right where where booth bay lives or where you know the end of pemaquid or you know there's yeah. there's a lot of a lot of places where where the utility can't be can't be on the ground right um with its with its current uh its current design what what is it 
is it is it uh, feasible to to add in these two-way grid segments, or or do you have to do you have to adopt a whole new system architecture all at once? You know, I mean, it sounds like the the utilities aren't terribly responsive to this kind of stuff. So yeah. You know, well, okay. What's so the, what's the so the, from a technical perspective, working with CMP in the Booth Bay Smart Grid Pilot Project um, and also in the Camden Rockland portion of the Mid Coast, and we're just starting in the Portland Loop area, um, if you were to talk to the technical staff that, that is responsible for keeping the lights on, they are thrilled by these ideas. These are more tools in their toolbox and they're smarter tools. Um, they're, the technology is more advanced, they're, they're rapid fire, um, they're interesting, challenging. I mean, they love it, and they'd love to implement this stuff. The bean counters are looking at it saying, well, wait a minute. What you're essentially doing is you're taking our monopoly franchise, which is delivering electricity and everything related to delivering electricity, we completely control and we get a guaranteed return on investment of 9 to 13 percent. So the bigger, the more build out we do on that grid, the more money we make. And you want me to open up that franchise and start paying this guy that puts solar with a smart inverter on the line, start paying him to deliver benefits that I used to deliver only. And so now I'm not, I'm not building out poles and wires anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm actually having the marketplace compete to provide the same resource. And that marketplace is willing to do it at a, because you want solar for other reasons. So you just want a little additional revenue stream to make your project pencil for you. So you're willing to do it at 5%. So suddenly we have a competitive marketplace to provide tr uh, electric delivery services that used to be a monopoly. Really, really tough in our um, political economy to, to do. Um, oh. Go ahead. Lots of ammo on their side, um, J-O-B-S being one of them, you know, the people who climb the lines to maintain, um, you know, um, help maintain the power lines. And also, just, we're such snobs, we're such elitists sitting here talking about this stuff. It's just, you know, what does the average person care? They just want to turn on the lights, they don't care where it comes from. Yeah, right, uh, except for they're the ones that are also paying the price in their insurance for the massive destruction in American South mm -hmm. due to climate change. And at what point are they going to say, I can't afford these insurance costs, we've got to do something. Um, so I, again, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the overall, I'm recognizing there's a political challenge to deploying a smart grid that will be very effective in delivering beneficial electrification and how difficult it will be. But I'm not really talking about that here. That, that's for the next stage. Let's, let's come circle back to the pilot. Um, what I'm describing. Thank you for taking that detour because those are the tough issues that people are wrestling with as you get your data and figure out, okay. That's right. I mean, those are questions we're going to have to confront. Mm -hmm. And it's good to know they're coming. But coming back to the pilot. Um, one, the other side of that coin is to, to build a working, functioning smart grid is going to require substantial investment and, there's, and, and a smarter investment. And there's plenty of room for the utility of the future to make a lot of money and be beloved by its ratepayers in helping deliver a carbon-free future that we want. So that's about cultural change in, in, the, in the utility sector, which has to be part of this overall mission. Um, but people have to understand how it would work and that it would work. And that requires having a working model that begins to deploy smart functions into the grid in a way that don't cause brownouts and blackouts and in a way that um, the grid operators have trust in, get experience in, and, and a way that ratepayers are saving money from, uh, and also in a way that um, makes for smarter 
overall investment. We need this uh, uh, robust distribution grid uh, operated by the utilities and a neutral platform for this whole thing to succeed. We need the utilities. We want them to be powerhouse economic motivators in our communities. Green Mountain Power is doing that, aren't they? Yeah, there's a, a great example of an a investor-owned utility that's way out in front of this. Green Mountain Power will um, sell you a remote PV system disconnected from the grid. You can buy electricity from them without even hooking up to their grid because a lot of times it's cheaper for them to do that than it is for them to extend a line to your house out in the mountains. Um, that's an example of a really smart utility that's begun that change. It's really changed the way they think. They deploy PV, they deploy batteries, the Tesla battery walls, the PV systems. And they increase their profits, I think. And their profits are going up. And do they also, they do heat pumps, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, and we've had them come to Revision's annual meeting and talk to us about their, their plan. It's a really thrilling, interesting example. So um, the goal of this pilot project is to have the, the granular energy load um, parcel by parcel and you know, uh, type of activity <coughs> and, and energy sector. So we have that kind of information. And we also are getting a... a living working model of the grid that can be continuously updated as we build solutions. So if you have those two models in place, you can start to then, the whole point of this exercise is to produce a menu of, act, of solutions. Tony. I don't get hung up on this. You uh, uh, used an interesting term, political economy, a little while ago. Uh, but I guess my question is, to your timing, like for example, I see that the city of Portland, I think it was Portland, maybe both cities, just launched a climate action solutions campaign of some sort. I mean, what's, the, what's, the, what's the timing for this grid solar data collection? And, and, and are events going to move past you? Or sure, sure, that's a good point. Um, it, we think it, it's a two-year project to get the, the working baseline benchmark data and the working grid um, model and we haven't started because we don't have the money to start yet we're raising we're in the um, fundraising stage for those two things right now <coughs> um, so let me answer this by talking about what we anticipate producing um, you guys know what a wedge analysis is where you you have a, a problem and the solution can um, be broken out like a pie chart uh, so you have 10 solutions and each solution in that pie chart becomes a wedge of different sizes. Um, so the idea of the two models is to develop a, uh, a menu of potential solutions. And they may be things that are already ongoing um, or things that haven't started yet. Um, and they may be that the, the wedge analysis, let's say that street lights have all been swapped out already. So you know that'll be added to the baseline data and won't be part of the wedge because it's already happened until we get some new streetlight technology and then it becomes a, a new wedge. Um, so the, the idea is to take the data and present it to the community saying here's how much energy you use, here's how you use it, where you use it, when you use it, what you're using it for in average in general among the whole community. We're not going to be like policing you took too many showers today in, you know okay. You and your children are, are the problem. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is uh, uh, very, the data is, all, data is all private, but very general information about how, where, and when we use electricity. And, um, <clears throat> and then to, to come up with solutions that the community is deciding whether it wants or not. And I, I give you an example. Um, the set of solutions might include weatherization programs subsidized um, by the community through, say, the, a PACE program or some other mechanism um, because that actually is cheaper than buying electric vehicles for um, every vehicle in the city fleet. So from a city's tax perspective, budget perspective, it says we can get the most bang for the buck here and we can we can get matching money from the private sector. Each homeowner has to put up three quarters of the cost, and this is just a 25% subsidy. 
And so the city might say, you know, that, that's more efficient than all of our composting and recycling and all other programs we got going in the city. That will do more carbon reduction than anything else. And the city might choose to do that. Or they might say, no, we're not putting money into private homes. We're only doing public things. And we're going to encourage businesses to, to meet these other needs, working together with residential users. Um, and we're going to do that by taxing um, delivery of oil and gas in the city. I mean, who knows what they're going to come up with. My only point is that <clears throat> we're trying to give the data and some and solution menu to, to work from. And the idea would be the two models are not static, that they're dynamic, that they're really turned over to the city staffs to continue to operate so they can continue to generate solutions um, and work with the utility and other um, providers, third-party providers, uh, that are trying to deliver carbon benefits. And a, a key point of this, of a collaboration with Sierra Club is Grid Solar views itself as the analyst. Um, and, we, and, and the idea of Sierra Club, the Sierra Club is in the, is in the education business. And so Sierra is going to really be doing all of the community outreach involved in sharing the, the data and the results and trying to drive solutions <coughs> and to um, collaborate with other stakeholders uh, as to the priorities and funding of various solutions. Um, and the, both cities have um, endorsed this idea wholeheartedly um, and are very, very excited uh, to, to participate and eager to get their hands on the, on the data because they want to make immediate use of it. In fact, I'm, um, there's a joint meeting of the Sustainability Committee tomorrow um, that I'm also doing this exact same dis discussion with, although not as long, thank goodness. Where's that going to be? Good job. <coughs> Good job. Yeah. Um, that is at Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and the first part of it is actually a presentation by GMRI on their climate change module which I can't describe, but you can look up online. I'm looking forward to learning about that tomorrow. Because we are getting to the end court questions. We well, last point is that we are, um, you know, we, we've got committed money for a, about a quarter of the overall cost, and revision is one of those that is committed. Um, we are, uh, have grant applications in, in a number of places. Uh, but we're still trying to raise money. So anybody with connections that might be willing to help us uh, raise some money for this effort um, would please talk to me. And from the National Sierra Club's perspective, uh, they're hoping that th this project will produce a model that could be adopted elsewhere. Um, so that's what we're doing. And um, I don't know. Do you have any questions? Steve. Uh, my name is Greg. Um, I'm curious what Grid Solar's perspective and um, take is on transactive energy systems utilizing um, sort of uh, more peer-to-peer um, -peer type transactions using blockchain technologies um, in a microgrid or in a larger grid system. Is that something you guys are looking into? Love it. Um, I would definitely recognize that that's probably how energy settlement's going to happen in the future. Um, I don't know how far away it is. So what he's describing is I've got surplus energy um, this hour, and you have load this hour. Um, you can, and so three other people have surplus energy using blockchain technology, Bitcoin essentially. Um, all those transactions could happen. Instantaneously. Instantaneously. <clears throat> and well, you'd be thinking you would be running along the wires That's my of question. the utility. Of course, yeah. Yeah. So utilities just being paid uh, the way brokers are being paid to deliver the benefits, but it, it means that right now you buy electricity from a third-party supplier that um, has the obligation of delivering that power to to you, but they don't really deliver it to you. What they do is they they buy they have to own the power when it enters the grid matching 
when you take it off the grid. Um, and that presupposes one supplier or 10 suppliers and one user. What Greg's talking about is there's you know, infinite number of users and suppliers all interacting in real time. You know, power just transactions moving constantly. Is there a European model of that, maybe, like in Denmark? It just makes so much sense. I mean, is I there some place outside the country to look? Steel farmers. There's what a, pluses and minuses. I don't know if there's one using a lot, utilizing like a blockchain type of transaction system, but there's a um, Brooklyn microgrid is a sort of a pilot system implemented in Brooklyn, utilizing I think 60 households, maybe okay. a quarter of which have PV on the rooftop, and it's piloted by a company called Hello3 Energy. So there's companies trying this out in different places. So the data collection for consumption is what you're looking at, parcel by parcel. Would that, this would mean sourcing, whereas the sources of power also, right? We would need that data collection. That's not part of what we're looking at in this project necessarily. Um, <clears throat> this would work, correct? Would that be no, it, we're, that's a really fine filter. Um, so right now, let's say if we were looking at energy load by parcel by parcel, we'd get a net annual. So if you had PV on your roof, we would not be able to tell unless you gave us the data how much you generated locally versus how much you bought from the utility. We'd only know what you bought from the utility because mm -hmm. we, we just can't get access that data yet. So, you know, it's going to require much uh, more information. That is truly a, a t to have a blockchain peer to peer transaction based grid, you truly have a smart grid that's able to generate enough data so that you can have real-time two-way transactions. Right now, we don't, we don't have that. So if, I'm, if I have this data, if I'm a broker, for lack of a better term, I would know where I could be selling my excess power with the data that you're coming up with. We, we're headed that direction. Yeah, I know we're heading that way. That's, so we're getting the data for where the power is being used. You're, no, but I mean, that's what you're seeking. We're, we're moving that direction to getting that data. Yeah. Interesting. So question. The Blue Bay Pilot Project was funded by the PUC, is that correct? Or no? It's funded by ratepayers. By ratepayers, but approved by the PUC. Yeah. And it was presented as a way to save money from preventing a build out of the grid. That's right. And this project for Portland sounds like you're coming up with um, potential solutions for reducing energy loads. Right? Well, potential PUC? solutions for reducing carbon intensity of our economy overall that um, may result in higher electric loads but lower oil and gas use, for example. Um, so, so would some of the projects qualify for uh, ratepayer funding? Absolutely, because the lower overall cost to ratepayers. Um, for example, um, let's use DOT's number. The, the grid has a capacity factor of 43%, meaning that um, for every 100 units of energy that are put onto the grid, 43 are actually used by an end-use consumer, so the, and the rest are wasted. And um, that we improve that through all these activities, we improve that capacity factor to 80%. That would that's, be. That's an efficiency. That's why efficiency is such a great thing. Yeah, that would yeah, result the in away. the net cost per unit of electricity for all ratepayers in dropping. Mm -hmm. So would would that warrant ratepayer investment? It would, and then that's the whole idea of the efficiency main trust, is to improve that capacity factor, and save everybody money. Um, and you see what, where we've been in the last eight years. Well, is that a potential source of funding for this project? Um, the, the PUC and the Efficiency Main Trust? I, I don't think in this, EMT doesn't have any money to spare. And in this administration, I can't conceive of the commission right. being willing. I mean, they're attacking wind and solar today. Uh, I can't conceive of them investing in long-term analysis to actually promote <laughs> distributed solar.
they're, I mean, they're, they're part of the problem. I don't see how they're not going to be. Um, that, not we're going to go now for the solution. Right, yeah. But to, to give you guys an example, the Booth-based Smart Grid Pilot Project uh, offset the need for construction of an $18 million power line uh, as, as the price that was estimated about five, six years ago from Edgecombe down to Booth Bay. Um, over the life of that power line, so its book depreciation term is 45 years. So utility puts up 18 million and they're paid back over the life of that power line over those 45 years, 75 million. So the, the net cost to ratepayers of the line would have been $75 million over its useful life. The Booth Bay pilot, which implemented smart sol grid solutions, offset the need to build the power line, cost six million. And over the, um, <clears throat> that six million is not eligible for um, ongoing capital payments by ratepayers to utility because it was not debt funded. And it's not, it didn't build up the poles and wires in the utility that they can continue to charge you for. So the total cost of that six million is six million to ratepayers. So um, that means the project saved almost seventy million to ratepayers. And what happened was, um, once the project showed itself to be successful, CMP came back and said, "Oh, by the way, we don't need it because electric load didn't grow as fast as we thought it was going to." Therefore, the existing lines are sufficient. We don't need to add a new line, and we don't need to pay for this battery and backup generator and PV and efficiency anymore. We can stop. So they've ended the pilot project. We've saved ratepairs. Um, because they would have built the line. Because they would have built the line otherwise. Now, and they've said, oh, well, we would have had to build the line because of old age in 20 years. So um, you know, then you save ratepayers. Uh, you put off the need to build that line by 20 years. So you've Doesn't it make you want to look at all their projects and <clears> say, <throat> what in this is actually fact and needed, and what is it that's just part of the churn because the utility is trying to build new things because depreciated assets go away? So that's what I want to do. Yeah, you're right, and, and that's, that's where the utility is thinking, um, how do you maximize value for shareholders? And, and for the management um, and put it in your own pocket, regardless of the impact to the economy, to rate payers, or to the environment, or the climate. And we're, we're not going to survive climate change if everybody in the, in the country continues to think that way. We really have to think about being a smarter, more efficient, more productive economy, not wasting in order to maximize personal profits. And um, okay, that, so to that, that cultural change has to happen. You obviously